Shortly after, three days later, we heard about the first person killed in the aftermath of 9-11. His name was Bulbir Singh Sodhi. He was killed by a man who called himself a patriot. Um, and my family knew him, so it was as if an uncle had been murdered. And this came along with news of attacks and beatings and stabbings just across the nation, and not only the extreme acts of violence, but subtle daily prejudices that seemed to consume the lives of Sikh, Muslim, Arab, Muslim, um, South Asian, really anyone who had brown skin was swept up into this picture of who counted as the enemy. And when I found this out, I did something quite noble. I um, escaped into my bedroom, and I locked the door, and I'm admitting this at Harvard Divinity School, I proceeded to read all three Harry Potter books. <laughs> seemed to be my only resource at the time. I preferred the black and white world of this fantasy novel where it was Harry versus Voldemort, good versus evil, compared to the complexity outside of my bedroom door, where it was all shades of gray, where Americans were killing other Americans. And I was completely paralyzed, completely shocked in paralysis, when sometime between page 177 and 178, I began to think of all the stories my grandfather used to tell me as a kid, um, how my family barely survived the 1947 partition of India, the 1984 anti-Sikh massacres that consumed New Delhi, and how in my California history book, these incidents had maybe four lines um, the largest, swiftest, most violent migration in human history, where my great uncle was burned alive in the lumber yard, and yet these stories remained invisible, buried beneath the surface. And that's when the idea came to me to document them. And of course, as um, the stories that were happening at this very moment, right, right outside my bedroom window. And as soon as I had that idea, I was flooded by a thousand doubts. I was only 20. I had absolutely no film experience. Who am I to document these stories? And that's when my grandfather's voice came to me. Nam Dan Isnan, he had said, the heart of the Sikh religion. In order to realize yourself and to realize God, you must act here and now without fear. And so I did. Um, I got in the car with my cousin. He was 18, I was 20, and we drove across the country for months. The journey turned into years as we wove into and out of the stories of hundreds of people, uncles and aunties and children, as we began to see how they saw themselves for the first time through the eyes of other people who saw them as foreign, as suspect, as not American. The entire journey ended in Punjab, India, where I met the widow of the first man who was killed and found the heart of America in her words. I came to Divinity School with all of these stories, nearly a hundred hours of footage, and there is one that stands out that I'd just like to share with you. I wish I could share all of them. And that is the story of my professor, my Punjabi professor in California, Atamjeet Singh. He told me that after 9-11, three different things happened to him. A group of kids came with their skateboards and threw his, their skateboards at him and his wife, and they barely escaped. The second time, he was called bin Laden on the train, and the train stopped, and he got off. The third time, the third time was different. The third time he was on a bus in San Jose when a man at the front of the bus stood up, turned around, red in the face, began pointing at him and yelling, hey bin Laden, get off this bus, go back to your country, go back to where you belong, cursing. My professor is completely still looking out the window. And then something remarkable happens the other people on the bus begin to stand up. The white woman, the Asian girl, the black man, they all stand up and they take this man's arm and they say, do you know who he is? He's a professor. You don't know what you're talking about. Sit down, sit down. And the man sits down. The bus comes to a stop and my professor gets off the bus and this man gets off the bus and the man comes up to my professor and reaches out his arm. And at this point, my body is cringing. At this point, I am ready to cry. I'm ready for the violence to happen because it's happened so many times before. And my professor tells me that the man takes my professor's hand and shakes it and says, I'm sorry. My granddaughter was just killed on that second plane that went into that second tower. I'm angry. I'm sorry. 
And what has stayed with me about that story is not necessarily the man's transformation, which is powerful, but the people on that bus. And I began to realize that we are the people on that bus. We are the people who can stand up in the most ordinary circumstances and draw upon some unnamed courage to do the most extraordinary things to fight for the kind of country and the kind of community that we imagine. I arrived at Divinity School with all of these stories, <laughs> trying to make sense of the whirlwind, of the chaos that I had just experienced. And uh, tomorrow I graduate, and the, my three years here have been a sort of dance where I've been here taking classes with Christian Green, with Diana Eck, with Hilla Hawker, with Michael Jackson, thinking about the ethics of storytelling, the ethics of narrative. And at the same time, I've also been a full-time filmmaker in Los Angeles, learning how to actually tell the story. And this dance has taught me so many things about what it is that I've actually been doing. And Diana, I, I hate to admit this, but... <laughs> Um, I graduate tomorrow, and I still don't think I can define what religion means. <laughs> we I thought about this panel, and I was thinking, what is religion? And I, the closest thing I can come up with in the broadest terms, the broadest terms, is that religion is the ground that sustains us, whether it's faith in humanity or the universe or God or ourselves or nature or each other. It's that ground from which we draw strength to face circumstances outside of our control. If violence, if pain strips us of voice, it renders us speechless, makes us feel completely vulnerable and powerless, then we draw upon something to speak, to regain our voice, to reclaim our agency, to make our story important and redemptive and part of the public sphere once again. And even... <laughs> even to the extent of having the audacity to face violence beyond proportions, beyond comprehension, something like 9-11 and its aftermath, to face that honestly with bravery and to reach deep into that pain, into that suffering, and to pull out something creative, something redemptive, something transformative, to, the, to have the audacity to tell a story that could redeem that time. I think it was my grandfather's voice, this religious ground, that sent me on the road after 9-11. And all the people I talked to, it must have been this ground from which they drew strength to tell me their story. And in turn, I have been able to have the privilege of seeing the power of those stories in the world. The story that I just told you about the man on the bus, I think I've told maybe 40 times that we've been um, to 40 different American cities across the country since September, since we premiered. And we have an audience just as diverse as this. Some people in the middle of Nebraska, we had um, many people who had never heard of Sikhs before, predominantly white audience even. And even those audiences give a standing ovation. And afterwards, I hear people stand up from the Jewish community, from the Catholic community, from the German, Irish, and then they say, this is my community story. An African-American man stood up and pointed to his braids and said, my braids are my turban. These remarkable acts of solidarity, so, so remarkable, remarkable that I begin to realize that the story about my community, about wanting to be counted, wanting to be recognized, is not just my story, my family's story, or even my community's. It happened to the Japanese-Americans during World War II. It happened to the, the, the Irish and the, and the British and uh, the Catholic. And beyond that, it's happened to the African-Americans and the Native Americans. I began to realize that this struggle to be seen to be counted as American has been part of our country's history from the very beginning. This, this, this fight to, to slowly but to patiently expand the circle of who counts as American and who counts as one of us. And what stories, I think, have the power to do is to break down that wall that divides us, to remind us of a time in our own life when we ourselves felt like outsiders, that we needed the strength of our brothers and sisters to draw up that courage to stand for each other, to see ourselves in one another, to fight for that community that we so long to imagine. That is a shared human hope that we can create together. <laughs>